Greetings. In this video lecture, I intend to give an overall picture and idea of how to determine the length of a, a curve. Now, a, a more rigorous approach, a kind of more detailed approach, needs a lecture much longer. But in this uh, lecture, I'm going to use uh, uh, geometry uh, as a visual aid to assist me to set up the analytical formula, also to assist uh, the audience, the students, for the uh, better comprehension of the subject and improves their conceptual understanding of the subject. Now, <clears throat> I will be uh, making two assumptions here. Number one is that the students have already been exposed, they're already familiar with derivative and uh, in, uh, definite integral. I'm not expecting about fundamental term of calculus for this really. And then the second assumption that I'm making is that the curve in the interval from A to B is a is a, a graph of a differentiable function, which means the curve is a smooth, because differentiability implies to continuity, but the converse is not true. And then what I will also do, I will use the, the interval from A to B, I partition it into equal, equal sub-intervals. The length of each sub-interval is equal. But I do not have to do that, but the reason I do it because of simplicity and also better comprehension as the first exposure to the subject. In case the intervals are not of the same length, then I will be using the word uh, norm and mesh instead of saying n approaches infinity. I have to say the mesh or the norm of the partition approaches zero. So uh, students are familiar with these vocabularies already. Okay then, and uh, uh, let's uh, start, shall we? Now, the function, as I said, is in the interval from A to B is what is a differentiable function. That is the graph of a differentiable function. So I started to, uh, in, this, uh, in this geometrical presentation, I, I divided into a, a tree in this case as you can see, three sub-intervals. Then later I make, I make my division into, let's say, 10, and then 100, and so on and so forth, and see what I can come up with. Now, I don't need really to collect data and put them into the chart and seek for pattern. I'm not, because I'm, by doing that, this primitive idea will lead me to uh, analytical formula, a general form of it. So in a sense, deductively I'm approaching to find an inductive kind of, uh, excuse me, inductively I'm approaching to find a deductive formula in a sense, to go from uh, a general to a specific later on. Now, the only tool that I need to use this one in this is a, a Pythagorean theorem. So let's uh, start, shall we? Now, I divide, as I already mentioned, the interval from A to B into, let's say, 10 sub-intervals of equal length. So I take the end of each interval, I give it to the function, function gives me a point on the graph, and I mark those points, all right, on the graph. Then I connect those two points, a line segment is formed, as you can see that. And then I use Pythagorean theorem, because I know the length of the... Uh, uh, delta A, uh, in this case delta X1, I know the length of what of the sub-interval and also I use uh, uh, the, the function that I have uh, to find the length of delta Y1 in this case and so I have these two from the information from the function and I use them to find what to, to find the length of this uh, uh, line segment. So I have written here, in this case, S1 is X1 minus X0 quantity squared plus Y1 minus Y0 quantity squared 
that I'm taking a square root of that, that gives me the length by Pythagorean theorem, give me the length of this line segment. So I do that for the S2 and S3 and so on, and then I come here and I start to increase the number of sub-intervals, as I mentioned already, to 10, and then 200, and so on, and then I add all of this, uh, all of these uh, uh, line segments, and the more, the, the smaller the line segments become, just common sense is that they get closer towards to the actual length of the, of the curve. Just common sense, huh? intuitively. Now, uh, I use um, uh, S to represent the summation of all these uh, line segments for N to go uh, 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 from, let's say, 10 or 100 and so on. So let's generalize this idea and use summation notation instead of individually adding them that takes a much longer a line. Uh, uh, for hundreds of them, they need a one mile long paper. Okay, now let me go to, to the second one, if I may. And the second one is I'm using the summation notation that the students are already familiar and those S1, S2, S3, S3, as I, I could write them in a big long line and takes very long, I'm squeezing them into this notation. It's a fascinating, this notation. And this notation says that you go from I equals to 1 to 10, excuse me, to N, and N can be 10, 100, and whatever you put there, and it says add them together. And the S is what is a still approximation, is not, is not what, is not actual length of the, of, the, uh, of the curve. But as number of N increases, then this becomes closer and closer to the actual length of that. And again, my point of here is not to collect data and seek for pattern that I do some other lectures, do some other things in mathematics. In this case, I'm again I'm repeating myself, I'm looking for what? For analytical formula that I'm going in a sense, I repeat again, from inductive approach to kind find a deductive formula for that. Okay then, now, the, this one, I do some algebraic manipulation. Now, uh, two numbers are very important and they do a lot of magic in mathematics. One of them is number one, which is multiplicative identity, and uh, the other one is the zero, which is additive identity. For instance, for completing a square or a dealing with problem, we add and subtract same things, we add and subtract. But adding and subtracting can make that manipulation of algebraic manipulation so simple and fascinating thing comes out of it that we couldn't do it without that. So I'm going to use this one, the, the magic of one, the skinny one I call it. And what I do, I know that I am going to end up with what derivative. So I have this one in mind, and I know that in order to get derivative, I have delta y squared. If I can have denominator of that delta x squared, then I can take the limit of that going to dx, uh, dy and dx, and then here it is the, 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 the what is it, the f prime of that has come up. Of course, mean value theorem can be also used here but I'm kind of giving a, a light lecture rather than going a little bit more in detail of that. Now, what I do, I multiply this expression, this one by one, but in instead of one, I write delta x i square over, the, excuse me, yeah, the delta x i square over delta x i square, which is my skinny one. And by doing that, I see that I have two terms, and these two terms, they have delta x i a square in common. So I factor that one out, and then delta x a square, because it's a square, is a factor, so it can come out of radical. So this expression ends up to be this looking like that. It's just cosmetic work in reality. It's like uh, putting makeup on somebody's face or dressing the face a person with a better cross looking. But the person who is inside the cloth is the same guy. So here, if this is exactly the same as this. I can't even say they're equivalent, they're identically the same. But they do look a little different. 
and that is the uh, tricks and the magic of uh, algebraic manipulation. Okay, now comes the moment of the um, the moment of truth. Now let's see what the moment of truth is. That is how we can get the analytical formula, which means the exact uh, length of the of the arc, rather than uh, approximation. Now let's see what that comes. And that comes when I take this summation that I already talked about. When I when the n approaches infinity. I repeat myself what I said a few minutes back, that if I am not working with n, then I have to set the mesh or the uh, norm of the partition approaches zero. So in this case, I'm saying that n approaches infinity, and when n approaches infinity, then students are already familiar with that, because the Riemann sum comes, and the students have already seen that in definite integral for area under the curve. Very similar to that is happening here, and so I get to the uh, definite integral, that is my, the length of my uh, interval, and that is what the function behind that. Now this is a function, uh, you can put it a prime of x if you want. Again, I'm not using a, a mean value term for that, because this is too explicit to see that one. I'm just uh, kind of skipping some stuff that is not really necessary. Now, uh, the formula, the analytical formula that give me the length of the, of, the, of the curve has been established. Now from inductive, inductive approach, I came up to a deductive formula, which is fascinating. Okay then, that is the end. I thank you for, uh, for watching, but I have also as a side to share with you uh, my experience because I've taught this course a couple of times, a few times in fact. So I know what, how a student think and why they think that way. So let me also mention a few words about that if I may. Especially freshman, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, calculus student that you're taking calculus for the first time. Now, one is that the students, this is a side, huh? the students have difficulty to know, to see the difference between delta x and dx. And to most of them, beginner, they feel like they are two different, uh, word, two different variables. They are, because it does, it stands for two letters of alphabet. Delta is a Greek letter, and x is, uh, you know, one of our alphabet. And same is true dx, which is both of them are letters of alphabet in our own alphabet. So, this is, uh, uh, then after a while, they get used to it. Some uh, textbook for this reason, they use the H, but I don't really like it, uh, and there is no need really. After you mention it one time to them, uh, you know, they grab it and they are comfortable. And then the second difficulty that the students have is about this notation. And the notation, historically, as we know, uh, Leibniz was uh, very creative for developing a symbol that, uh, that carries with it very good ideas. The idea is carried by the symbol. And they say historically that sometimes he was spending uh, days, if not weeks, looking for, say, for a more suitable um, uh, uh, symbol representing the idea. And this dy over dx is his symbol that he was using. And there is a lot of advantage using this one, but uh, Newton was using y prime for a derivative. And sometimes also that has a little advantage, but for the time being, we are going to deal with that and see how the students have difficulty with this one. Now, this one some, can stand for differential, that is a lecture of its own, or can stand for derivative of y with respect to x which means we are differentiating, and the variable that we are differentiating with respect to is x. So I usually write it this form. D, I write the y letter separate so that they do not get confused with the differential, the subject of differential. And uh, also uh, the, 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 the difference between delta x and dx is that delta x is the change of x in our own world, in the world of mathematics that we deal with, but dx is when delta x approaches zero 
and then mathematics, uh, we cannot go further than that. So he goes to the world of infinitesimal. He goes to the world of midgets, that the inhabitants are points. as a galaxy of its own. And in that, in that form, then delta x changes the form into dx. So dx stands for, again, one more time, is a dead change of x, but in the, in the infinitesimal world. So hopefully, a students are comfortable with that difference. Now, the second thing that the students have difficulty with, in my experience, is, um, is this one. The second derivative of, uh, of uh, y with respect to x is kind of a little bit confusing, this notation for them. Now, this notation means the derivative of the derivative. So the function is differentiable, and the, the derivative of that is so differentiable. So it's taking another derivative. Then it says, OK, if this is the case, you write ds square y. Why didn't you also write ds square x square? Why do you write dx square? The student keep asking for that. And uh, what happened to uh, use multiple d and d is d square. So what happened to that? Uh, uh, you know, when you multiply like that, it does look like d square y, and then should be d square x square. No, the answer to this question is that this notation stands for derivative of derivative of y with respect to x. Now the reason is important. As I said, this one is uh, one entity, by the way. Now, the reason is that sometimes a function uh, is a multivalued function, in fact, is a, the, 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 the subject can be a function of more than one variable. So you may take derivative with respect to one of the variable, <clears throat> then second time, you may take the derivative with respect to some other variable. But here, he emphasized that you are taking derivative of the function with respect to the same variable. So it's a single-valued function in this case. So this is what this notation means. So it does not mean dx times dx, which is d square x square. It just means that you're taking derivative of the first derivative, but you're taking again with respect to the same variable that you were taking the first, the first function of. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I wish you all uh, uh, prosperity and happiness, and uh, until more coming videos, I wish you prosperity. So long.